Hey everybody, good evening. Uh, my name is Alex Martin. I am the technical lead for SC Codes, and I'm really happy to have y'all here with us on Monday, hopefully safe at home like I am. Uh, tonight I'm gonna be talking about some, kind of how to get started and handling some of the questions that we see really often at our program and on our platform, but I'm also open to questions from you. So we've got Leah in chat. Um, opening up some questions and encouraging people to introduce themselves, and I'll be keeping an eye on that and answering those as I can as well. Um, so please, please don't hesitate. If you have any sort of questions or anything that you're curious about that we haven't covered or something you'd like to dig more into, just let us know in the chat box there, somewhere in your browser, and we'll be happy to, to help answer those questions. <laughs> hey, Leah, how are you? So, I am the technical lead for SC Codes. And what that means is I handle our curriculum and I handle our platform, which is the website that you go to to, to take courses on. And that's, a, that's something I take really seriously uh, because I think it's, it's really important for us to have a, a platform that is accessible and available to as many South Carolinians as we can. Uh, and that's what SC Codes is all about, is bringing access to people who maybe wouldn't have that access otherwise. Uh, our goal is to fill the technical gap in the state. And what we mean by a technical gap is lots and lots of jobs, but not many skills. There are a lot of people who could maybe fill those jobs, but they don't live in the right area, or could fill those jobs, but they don't have quite the right training. And so our goal is to help you get forward on that path and get started on that path. And that's why the question that we hear most often is, how do I get started? People are really unsure of what steps to take once they've decided, hey, I might be interested in computers or coding or programming, so where should I go? And we hope we can give you a platform that not only answers those questions for you up front, but also gives you those first steps and helps launch you into maybe a new career, maybe a new job, maybe just a hobby that you could enjoy. Uh, and that's really what we focus on with the SC Codes platform. So the question that, that we hear most often is clearly, where do I get started? But we hear that from two different kinds of people. And I, I wanna talk a little bit about those kinds of people and maybe you fall into one of these camps and maybe you don't. And certainly let us know in chat if there's a different category that you find yourself in. The first category that we hear from most often is people who have no experience at all. And that's awesome. If you're asking the question and you're interested in getting started, that's the hardest part. From there on, it's super easy. So. SC Codes is aimed at really those people the most. We'll give you those first steps, and then we'll give you support as you grow. Um, and so we offer, and I'll go over some of our courses later, but we do offer courses that will start you from ground zero. You know, you, you know how to type, you know how to open your computer, and now you want to learn about programming. And that's really a, something that, that we value and something that we want to encourage people to, to be involved in. The other group of people that we hear from sometimes are people with a little bit of experience. Hey, Rodney, welcome. And so people that have a little bit of experience maybe have taken some classes elsewhere, maybe even have done a project, but aren't sure where to go next. And in those cases, we wanna provide a, a nurturing environment. We wanna bring those people in and say, hey, here's a guided path you can take to get to that next step. And we've got courses that cover that as well. Uh, one nice thing about the platform that I'll show you later is all of our courses are available to everybody. And so you don't have to come in and complete a prescribed path if you don't want to. You can start at higher levels. So if you have a little bit of experience, but you're looking for those next steps, this is a really, really good place to start. Hey, Scott. Welcome to the chat. So to, to have a better understanding of where you might want to get started, you have to know a little bit of vocabulary. And there are two big words that are used all the time in software development and technical roles and even job postings that no one ever really bothers to define, which is a kind of a bummer, honestly. Uh, it's a really big hurdle for people getting started to see words they don't understand. And it's an even bigger hurdle when those words aren't made clear right away. So I'm gonna pull up just a, a quick couple of slides. I'll swap over here. There we go. So I wanna talk about front end and back end because these are things that you will see in job posts. You will see from 
um, recruiters you will see on side projects if you try to pick up freelance work you're gonna see things about front end and back end and there's just not enough explanation about what these mean so I like using practical examples I think that's a that's a helpful way to relate topics and that's a helpful way to cover new things and so I'd like you to think about a restaurant I know right now that's tough because I know I'm thinking a lot more about restaurants than I used to, just because I don't go to them right now. <laughs> uh, but let's consider the restaurant experience and what that's like. Now, there's the part of the restaurant that you interact with as a customer, right? That's the part of the restaurant that is the tables and the tablecloths. It's the plates you're served on. It's the people who serve you. It's even the, the front doors and the restrooms. Restaurants in the, in the industry refer to that as front of house. And that's anything that your customers interact with. Oop, thanks for letting us know about that audio, Scott. Let us know if that clears up, please. So in a restaurant, the, the front of house is where your, your customers interact. <clears throat> and what that means is anything a customer touches, sees, does as part of their restaurant experience is on the people responsible for the front of house. And usually that would be a gener general manager or somebody at the front podium there. You know, it's easy to think about that as just inside the restaurant, but that's also outside, right? That's the parking lot. That's the advertising. There's lots of things that front of house is responsible for that isn't just inside the restaurant, but it's everything that the customers interact with. Now, on the other side of the restaurant, on the other side of the industry, you have the back of house. And that's the kitchen, which is the first thing most people think about, but it's also the back office. It, depending on the type of restaurant we're talking about, maybe there's a lounge space for employees. Maybe there's a locker room or a changing area. Um, this even goes down to utilities. The restaurant can't run without power or without water or without a dumpster out back. But these aren't things that customers interact with, right? You're not turning the lights on. You're not pouring anything out of a faucet. You clearly, if there's no water, you may have a poor experience, but that's not the responsibility of somebody who's serving you. These are all things that support the restaurant. And the restaurant wouldn't be there without both the front and back of house, but the interactions between either employees or customers differ based on which side you're in. We draw that same kind of line in software development and in programming. So front end, is the, the analog, the, the comparison to front of house in the restaurant. And the front end of a website is everything that a user interacts with. So that's all the design elements, all of the colors and the fonts that you choose, where you put things on the page and how they flow as you scroll. All of that comes in the front end. You've also got interactivity as part of your front end engineering. And so that means if there are buttons on the page or there's pop-ups if things happen when the user does something that's a user interaction and a front-end engineer is who designs that and who makes that work it even goes down to art and so designers nowadays in the web typically are involved in the front end this means that they're deciding not only what the art is but where it goes on the page how it's laid out and how other parts of, of art elements are animated or respond to the user so if you're somebody who's artsy, or if you're somebody who's really interested in interacting with your users, with the people who are coming to the application or site that you've built, front-end engineering is a really, really good way to go. Uh, it opens up a lot of doors. It gives you a lot of direct touch points with your users. And that can be a really nice thing. On the other side of things, just like the back of house and the restaurant, we've got the back end of a website. And the back end of the website is what supports the front end. And the back end can support multiple front ends. Just like a restaurant might have a pickup window and a, a seating area, a web app might have a mobile app on your phone and a website. And so the back end is going to be what supports all of those different front ends, all of the designs and, and design elements. But the back end doesn't have any real design elements. It's more of a, you know, I hate to use the numbers example because that feels kind of scary but it's very much a, a numbers and text land. Instead of dealing with art and colors and fonts, you're dealing with things like databases, which is where you store all the data you get from your users. You're dealing with things like validations. You know, When you 
press a button on a form and it pops up and says, sorry, that doesn't look like an email address. That was a backend engineer who checked that for you. You're also dealing with business logic. And this is where backend engineering gets a little bit more fun, right? Business logic means the things that make your business unique, the parts of your app or the parts of your website that really make your app saleable, make it stand out. So let's think about a shopping app, right? When you go to that application, it looks nice. You've got a search bar, you've got little graphics, all of that's done by the front end engineers. But how does that site know which things to show you for recommendations? How does that site know what things to give you as up next or coming soon that you might be interested in? That's business logic. That's data science that's been massaged and worked into the application by a back-end engineer. The same thing for a travel site. Uh, the front end, the form experience, when you click a button, if an air, airplane goes across the screen, that's a front end experience. But the bookings themselves being smooth, checking with all the different hotels out there that, that have rooms available or travel providers that are being checked, that's back end engineering. Back end engineers also usually cover communication. And so if you are building an app that sends a lot of emails or that sends a lot of text messages, or an app where you have live chat, something like maybe Slack, which we offer through SC Codes, you're gonna be doing a lot of backend engineering because those are the people who are managing when those emails get sent or when those text messages go out and confirm that they get where they need to go. So these are two sides of a coin, right? These two terms are, are really important to have a basic understanding of, but every application is gonna have both. And most engineers will, will lean one way or the other. Uh, in my experience, and for myself, I'm much more of a back-end person. Uh, I'm just, I like websites. I can build websites that look decent and that work well, but I really enjoy the numbers side of it, which is why I'm always afraid to say math and numbers because people get scared. And it's not really math. It's not calculus or any sort, any sort of like wild calculations happening. It's just a matter of being able to work with data, see things in real time, see things super fast and help speed them up. I get a, a really, really big sense of achievement out of. Uh, and it's funny in my personal life that that extends to even like the kitchen. To go back to the restaurant example, uh, when I have big families over or uh, big groups of friends, I tend to be the person in the kitchen cleaning up and cooking because I enjoy seeing that back of house. Whereas I, my wife or maybe some of my other friends may lay out the tablecloth or lay out the utensils or decide what people want to drink. And so that's just kind of a funny personality thing that people tend to gravitate towards. And understanding these terms makes it really, really easy to decide on a direction because you're not just lost out in cyberspace and saying, ah, eh, I wanna learn programming, I don't really know what that is. But you can think about, well, hey, maybe I like being a support in a support role. I don't need to pick the pictures. I don't need to design the button, but I want to see how the application works. And on the other hand, maybe you want to choose the art. Maybe you have really strong feelings about serif and sans serif fonts. And that's, that's okay. That's great. There's a role there for you. One other really important thing to understand about these two kind of categories of programming is that the lines are a little gray. You know, as a back-end engineer, if you go down the back-end path, you're going to learn some front-end. You're going to have to build interactive uh, components. You're going to have to work with users. So you get to learn a little bit of both, but you can lean towards the back-end. As you progress in your career, you can choose to specialize. And so specialization might look like somebody who is really into animation, gets very, very good at animating. That would be a very specialized front-end engineer. And you could get to a point where all you do is design the animations on Facebook, right? All the buttons, all the links, all the images, you could be the designer for those. On the other hand, you could really dig into backend and you could get to a point where all you do is work with data. You work as a data scientist, you look at a spreadsheet all day, you filter things, you write scripts to automate processes. And that's great too. It comes down to personal choice, and it comes down to knowing how to target the time that you're spending learning so that you're getting the most out of it. Um, and this is just one way to kind of split that focus. Now, there's another term that I regrettably don't have a slide for. Pop back over here. There's another term that you'll see a lot, which is full stack. 
And, and this is something we're starting to see less of, but I think we're going to start seeing more of in a kind of a post-pandemic world. Full stack means somebody who is both a front-end and back-end engineer. Uh, you could think of it kind of as a technical generalist. A uh, full stack engineer is somebody who can work on the front end and can do art and pick colors and typefaces and can equally well work on the back end and design databases and lay out um, the structure of an application. And sometimes full stack extends even beyond that. Um, if we go back to our restaurant example, being a full stack engineer is like being a chef who also waits the tables, who also maybe drives the garbage truck. It's somebody who can provide even further services outside of just building the website and supporting it. And so the title full stack can be a little bit tricky uh, because there aren't really any clear expectations in that, right? If you ever see a job post for a full stack engineer, it's important to, to dig into what they're looking for and to understand what your role is going to be because chances are you're going to lean towards the back end or towards the front end, unless this is a really brand new building a new website from scratch. And so that's just one of those little hazards that I've seen that I like to, to warn people about. It's, it's a good word to know. You will see it. The, you know, it's full dash stack usually just like front dash end, but it can be a little tricky and expectations can be hard to manage around that. Um, but certainly, you know, after a few years of working in the back end or working in the front end, you'll get a better feel for what you do best and, and what you do worst. And you can sell yourself as a full stack engineer who specializes or as a full stack engineer who, you know, knows a lot about kind of the middle area between the two. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Looks like Scott, you asked about logic. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, that may, may be a little bit behind on chat there as well. So the, once you understand that terminology and you have an idea of full stack, front end, back end, and you can kind of sit down and think about the things you like to do and what kind of programming you might like to do, it gets a lot easier to choose a course and to choose a path. And I'm going to pull up the SC Codes course catalog here just to give you an idea of how our courses map to these concepts. So. One of these courses stands out is very, very easy to map to a concept, right? And that's front end basics. It's got the word front end in the name, um, but it can be a little bit confusing as to whether or not you should start there or you should start somewhere else. Uh, we're working on a concept called paths and paths are groups of courses you can take if you're really interested in a, a certain concept. And so in the example of front end, the path with our current catalog might be going from JavaScript concepts um, to front end basics. Now in our catalog, concepts courses are meant to be the most basic possible course. A concepts course is starting from zero. You've never done any programming again, which is great. Um, and a concept course lets you experience programming from the start in a really low stakes environment. Um, you can usually finish them in a weekend, maybe even in a couple hours if you can sit down and just chug through them. And it's a really great way to experience what something might be like. The JavaScript concepts course is a front end concepts course. JavaScript is a front end language. It's a programming language that works right inside your browser. So it doesn't need a server or any sort of back end or, or extra technology to support it. And so you can do these really great things in JavaScript that you can run right in your browser and run live right there and see it happen. So that concepts course is a good first step. And then once you have some experience either through the concepts course or you have actual work experience, you can move into something like front end basics, which is going to be a longer course that'll probably take you maybe a couple weekends, maybe a week. You might stretch it out for a month or two. Um, but that's going to give you a lot deeper experience and is going to let you build more complicated applications and is going to teach you more of what it's like to do this day to day as you build these really big, complex uh, tools. Yeah, and just like Leah said, the, the concepts courses are really designed to be done quickly. Uh, one thing that we're, we're really proud of, you know, regardless of vocabulary, regardless of front end or back end, all of our courses are easy to drop into and, and drop out of. 
So if you come into something and you don't like it, you can try another course. If you come in and you don't really know how much time you have, you can see how many modules are right inside that lesson, and you can choose whether or not you want to knock out one of them or 10 of them or just finish the whole module before you wrap up. Uh, and so certainly once you have a course decided, there are some pretty cool tools you can use to, to help you manage your time around that. Scott, that's, that's exactly right, man. I think that's the word that I probably was searching for there. Um, Backend programming is very much about logic. Uh, it is, it's a way of thinking about how the computer thinks and trying to translate those little ones and zeros that run everything internally out to human needs. Like, hey, I want to book a hotel room or I want to buy some shoes. Uh, the backenders are, are who handle the logic around that. Um, that's a, that's a perfect, perfect term to apply there. So backend is, is a little bit more confusing because backend um, can be supported by a number of different languages. So whereas front end tends to be JavaScript, um, there are some other languages, but they're not really common. Backend is going to be things like Ruby, things like Java, uh, things like Python, which you may have heard of. Backend support, since it runs on a different type of computer, it's going to run on a server across the internet, is a lot harder to find. Um, and certainly there's more of a, a technical kind of ramp up and a little bit of a, a learning, learning cliff there to get over when you start to, with technical concepts. But we do have two technical concept or uh, backend concepts courses, and that's Java and Ruby. You know, the difference between these is Ruby is typically used for web applications. Ruby is really commonly used for websites that you see every day. Uh, one of the most famous ones is Shopify which if you've used a shop online or you've bought from anybody, you've probably seen a Shopify site. That all runs in Ruby. Uh, that is the language they use. Java, on the other hand, can be used for websites, but can also be used for software on your computer. It can be used for software in your car, in your refrigerator, on your mobile phone. It's, it's everywhere. And so Java is a little bit more complicated because it's an older language and has to support more, uh, more tools, more platforms. But it's also a really in-demand language because of that. And especially in South Carolina, where we have a tendency towards more industrial and kind of larger employers uh, compared to somewhere like San Francisco, where it's a lot of startups, Java is really highly in demand and is a really interesting language to explore if you would like to work at one of those bigger companies. In the case of Ruby, we've actually got a, a full, nice long path you can take going from Ruby concepts up to Ruby basics, which is gonna dive a little deeper into the fundamentals of Ruby and backend programming, and then all the way up to Ruby on Rails, which is Ruby with some extra front end magic and kind of gives you a whole vision of a web application coming together. This particular path is pretty long. This isn't something, um, if you take concepts and basics and then Rails basics, that's gonna give you a lot more depth, but that's also gonna give you a lot more time. Uh, this is something we don't expect people to complete in a week or maybe even a few weeks. The good thing is when you come out of this you'll have a really deep understanding. And so if you're interested in programming as a career and you think that back-end programming might be the way you want to go, this could be a great path to take. Try out both of our back-end, kind of see which language you like, and then experiment deeper with Ruby and build some more, uh, build some more tools, build some more applications. And so those are the two biggest paths based on either front end or, or back end interest that we've currently got content for. Uh, now, the good news is we're constantly adding new content. Uh, we've been improving some of these older courses thanks to your questions, and uh, we are <clears throat> starting to look at some new content in the future to extend our front end course and add some extra back end pathways. And so we should see pretty soon some new stuff here that you can dive deeper in. Um, so we certainly don't want you to feel left out. But when you're looking to, to get started, those are really the, the things to ask yourself and the things to dig into is what kind of work do I want to do? What part of an application might I want to work on? One really nice thing about knowing the words here. There we go. <laughs> One really nice thing about knowing this vocabulary, knowing these terms, and knowing which path you might want to take is that once you get past that, the next steps are the things you've heard your whole life. 
Um, and I, I don't want to harp on the things every business book has, that was ever written has told you to do. <laughs> but the best ways to get started programming are consistency, uh, because your brain is, is going to retain knowledge just like a muscle grows as you flex it. And so setting five minutes a day, ten minutes a day, an hour every weekend aside to focus on programming is going to give you really consistent gains in your knowledge and your understanding. And you're going to be able to dive deeper because you have that consistency. The other thing that's really important to remember is perseverance. And again, it sounds a little bit like a business book, but programming can go on the same day from being the greatest thing you've ever done to the worst. Uh, you know, I've done this full time for many years, and I did it as a hobby and part time for many, many years before that. And there are days still where I wake up and I have a problem right away and the rest of my day is ruined. And there are other days where I wake up and I solve problems, bam, 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 all day and feel fantastic. And so you have to start building from the, the start, both that consistency and that ability to get over that new stuff. And one cool thing that we offer that we don't ever want you to forget is SC Codes isn't just a platform, it's also a community, right? We have literally thousands of students and mentors and employers and all sorts of people from all around the state who are, are connecting on our platform. And so if you're having trouble or you're just starting a course and aren't sure what things might look like for you, we've got Slack. Uh, you'll get a link in the learner's guide when you first start to our Slack channel where all of our mentors live, where most of our students are active, where you can ask questions, you can introduce yourself and you can join local groups to, to meet up with people. Um, certainly right now, local in-person meetings aren't happening like they used to, but that's something we're looking at phasing in in the future. And you can get to know people now so that when you're a little more comfortable going out or maybe you find a nice six foot round table, you can all sit with your laptops and work through problems together. The other thing that we offer in terms of community is that long-term support. You know, we, we have a job board on the site. We have employers that search the site. And so if this is something that you're really making a career change and making a big leap, we can help you move to that next step, whether that's a new job or a whole new career or just a promotion or a hobby that you're interested in. And so that's the kind of support that we want to make sure that you've got, because in a lot of cases, it's support that the, you know, the people behind this program didn't have coming up. And we want to make sure that you've got that now while it's so easy to give. And I am, um, to reiterate what Leah said, I am here to answer questions. We usually run to about 7.30, but I am happy to run over. Um, certainly if you have questions about vocabulary or jobs or any of our courses, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, and if you don't have them right now, but you think of them later, you're welcome to contact us on the platform. You, know, you can ask questions under any of the lessons. Um, or you can contact us through the website. You know, we, we have our emails on there. You can email us at mentors at sccodes.org. And you can access Slack and hop in and talk to us live. And I or Leah or anybody else in the program would be happy to, to help you out with what you got going on. So one of the, one of the most challenging things about vocabulary, and it's silly because I've, I feel bad just talking about words sometimes. Like people think programming, it should be magic, right? You should pull up lots of code and look through it. But I find that really intimidating. And I find this, these different words and this different language really, really intimidating. And, and my goal as a, a technical lead in charge of the curriculum and in charge of kind of helping make sure our students see things that we enjoy, um, see things that we find valuable, is to make sure we're not intimidating students away. Um, that's a really, a really big topic. And so hopefully this vocabulary is helpful for you and helpful as you look at jobs and look at the platform and try to decide what to do next. So Leah asked if I prefer front end or back end. I very much prefer back end engineering. Uh, and that is mostly because I am not an artist. I, I have some really great designer friends who I can lean on for advice and support, but I don't know the difference between Helvetica and Times New Roman. I barely know the difference between Royal Blue and, and Navy Blue. Uh, that's just not my strong suit. <laughs> And so I have learned over time and have leaned hard into the back end side of engineering uh, just because that's what I enjoy. Um, I do go back to constantly how many things in my life I can look back at and go, oh, yeah, I, I, I kind of do like back end. I tend to stay out of the crowd at parties. I tend to 
prefer to be the one serving drinks to being the one taking the drinks or being out on the dance floor. And, and those little personality quirks will translate as you start learning programming, um, which is a fun, a fun thing to, to find out about yourself. Checking in over here. So another thing that can be uh, intimidating when you're first starting is not knowing the names of languages. Uh, and so that's something that definitely the programming community hasn't done a great job of helping people, right? Uh, JavaScript, for example, is a front-end language. Those terms don't really have anything to do with each other. Um, even more confusingly, JavaScript and Java have nothing to do with each other. JavaScript was named after Java in an attempt to uh, combat on the market and to take some market share. And so that's another thing that can be tough to learn. But now that you know front end and back end uh, as separate concepts, you can look up these programming language names. So if you find out about, say, Ruby and you want to learn more about it, you can go search something like Ruby back end versus front end. And you can learn a lot about how a language is used just by those search results and, and just by what, what people are asking online. Yeah, absolutely. So Leah asked what I would recommend uh, in terms of getting started and the getting started guide. And that is 100% the best place to start your journey. Uh, when you log into SC Codes for the first time, this getting started course uh, down here on the bottom right is the, the first thing that you should dive into. And in that course, we do cover a little bit of this front end back end definition. Um, I've tried to really dig into it tonight because I think it's, it's extremely valuable. But we do give you a little review and point out some of those paths that we talked about. So like the JavaScript path or the Ruby path um, that you could take if you know what you're interested in already. That's Inside that guide, you'll also learn how to work on our platform, how to go through courses, how to mark things complete, how to run code right there in your browser so you don't have to install anything. And you'll learn how to get help. So that's where you'll find links to our Slack community where you can chat live with us at any time, 24 hours a day. Sometimes I'm up late, so you never know. Uh, and you'll learn how to leave questions. So if you're working on a lesson and you're having some trouble, you can ask us a question and we'll respond to it within uh, usually a day or two, sometimes even shorter. Yeah, so Leah also asked about the Command Line Basics course. Uh, Command Line Basics is kind of an interesting bird uh, it is meant for people who want to work on the terminal. And what that means is when you're working on websites and servers, especially on the back end, but also on the front end, it's important to know how to navigate your computer the way the computer thinks about it. So not from Finder, not with folders and directories, but just with text. And so in that, the Command Line Basics course, we go through how to navigate the computer just with text. It's a black screen with white letters. It's just like you've seen in the matrix, uh, but it's really easy to understand. And it's a good way to get more familiar with the internals of your system and understand better what's happening as you build you know, systems on top of this, as you build websites and applications. Uh, that is a, a topic, like a line of questioning that we're really interested in exploring more, uh, but that's kind of our first intro there. And as we, as we see more interest, we may look at expanding that to Windows or even going a little deeper into how systems work. Scott, let's see. Yeah, Scott, that's exactly right. So Scott asked and said, if you have a problem with a tablet and you call customer support, uh, they'll work with you in dealing with the front end of that. Uh, and he's right, yeah, the, the front end is the part of that tablet that you're interacting with. Now, there's a back end supporting that front end, right? There is a, a computer inside the tablet, and the code inside that computer is back end code, but you're never really interacting with that. You're just interacting with the tablet. So customer support is gonna be dealing with the front end and helping you click the buttons on the front end and interact with the settings on the front end. Uh, back end is what the developers who work at Apple or Samsung or Vio, whoever made your tablet, that's what those developers are building is the back end of that. And that's not only the code that's in the tablet that supports the, the screen that you touch and everything you interact with, it's also the code way off in servers in California that stores your data, that stores your uh, login information or that ver verifies your password. It's the servers that might be in Virginia at the same time that send you emails. 
and that manage the messages that you get back and forth. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a really great example, Scott. The idea of the tablet as kind of the the front end that you interact with, and the back end being all of that supporting infrastructure. Yeah, good way to define it. One nice thing about our platform too is we're always looking for suggestions, uh, and we're we're as open to those as we are questions. You know, we want this to be something that everybody can use. And so, if you have questions, or if you have uh, suggestions, or uh, if you have complaints, if you find a problem with with one of our courses, you can let us know through those same channels we offer for questions. So on Slack or right in the lesson. Uh, when there are problems with the course, we'll definitely jump on those. And, uh, and try to address those as quickly as possible. When there are suggestions, we do keep a backlog and we're constantly working, um, just like I said earlier, working on new content, working to expand our current content. And so it doesn't have to be a question, but if you have a thought while you're working on something about, hey, I wonder how this part works, or I wish I learned more about that, let us know. And we'll certainly add that to the list and keep new stuff coming so that we're getting you the things that you wanna learn about. Uh, because ultimately that's that's our goal is to make sure that we're filling that tech gap and we're training people with as many skills as we can. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, and thanks for thanks for asking those questions, Scott. That's really, really helpful. Um, certainly, if you're asking those, there's lots of other people who are wondering that too. Sure. So Rodney asked a great question, and that is, you know, we're, we're always learning. We know we're always learning. But at what point do you know that you know enough to say, hey, I know what I'm doing. I'm a programmer. Um, and that's that's a tough question. Uh, you know, in, in my I started out as a hobbyist, kind of to, to give you some context. I started programming when I was really young. It was just for fun. I went to medical school. I did a whole different career thing for a while. And, and ultimately decided that wasn't for me and came back to programming as a career, um, having done it just for fun my whole life. And I struggled with that question, and I still struggle with that question, of knowing at what point I really do know things. And there's a concept in, in every discipline, but in tech it's really popular, called imposter syndrome. And that's this concept that you never really feel like you know enough. You know, maybe even as a senior engineer you're still going to Google. I think the best way to, to gauge yourself and to know that what you know is valuable is by building things. Uh, and that's, that's something that we focus on in our curriculum, but you can focus on yourself. You don't need SC codes for that even. Um, but I think it's really important that you, you try to practice what you've learned. And so that may mean just sitting down in your terminal or in an, an editor that lets you write code for a website and just building a website. It might be silly, it might not look great, it might just be a picture of your cat and a button that sends you an email, but that's your website and you built it. And that is an incredible feeling when you can go from a, a blank page to something that you built just with the things you know. And you do that once and you add that cat picture. And you do it again, you add two cat pictures. And by the end of it, you build a website where you can design your own cat picture. And so you build on that knowledge, you build on those topics, and that's what reinforces for yourself that you really know the things you think you know. Uh, and in my experience, that is the best way to, to gauge yourself and find out if you're at a point where you can be comfortable. Um, another thing that I've seen recommended pretty often is to go to job interviews. You know, the especially in tech, there are a lot of jobs that interview remotely, so it's pretty low stakes. You know, you might have to put a nice suit on and make sure you don't drop your camera like that guy in the news so they see you're not wearing pants. Um, I am, I'm wearing pants. You should wear pants. <laughs> but doing a job interview is a good way to see where you're at because if you go into a, an interview with somebody and have no idea what they're talking about and are just immediately lost, then maybe you need to study up a little more and you can use the interview to learn the things you need to study. But you might go into an interview thinking you don't know anything and just really blow the interviewer away when you can answer their questions. And so that's another good place to, to practice and to learn kind of what's out there. Certainly, you can always talk to other people. You talk to other programmers and, and ask questions and see if they tell you, hey, that's kind of basic, let's give you some, some examples. Or if they say, oh, that's a really good question, let's learn together. And that'll let you set a baseline as well. Um, 
I think I gave kind of three examples there. The biggest one is building things, if you want to, to find out what you know. Uh, doing job interviews or talking to employers. You don't have to be a formal interview, but just kind of talk to people, get an idea of what they're looking for. And talking to other programmers, I think, are, are three ways to find out how much you really know. But that is an excellent question. Um, and that is something that can be tough to, to bear, but certainly we all, all the people I've ever worked with, have, have wondered that at some time or another. Yeah, thanks, Rodney. <laughs> One of the really interesting things about building things in programming is that becomes your portfolio and that becomes your resume. Um, and it's funny for me to think about because I can't think of many other disciplines. I guess, I guess arts are kind of like that, where you paint something to build a portfolio. But generally, your resume is how long you've worked at places and, and what kind of work you did there. Oh, and Rodney just asked about building a portfolio uh, to show to interviewers. So this is, this is perfect. Um, so yeah, to, to build that portfolio, you build projects. And that's really one of the interesting things about programming is the more you build, the bigger your portfolio becomes. What I like to recommend is for people to build maybe 10 projects and then go back and reiterate on those and, and rebuild them, right? Kind of tweak them. Because by the time you get to the end of those 10 projects, you're going to realize, hey, I know this a lot better. I could have done something differently on my first web page. Excuse me. And so you can go back to that first web page and you can do things differently and kind of see, see how much you've grown. And that's what builds your portfolio. And we do talk a little bit on our courses about using tools like GitHub, um, which is a, a website that's known as kind of the, the programmer's resume. It's so somewhere you can share your code so that other people can see it. But also having a personal website is a really good place to put a portfolio. Um, if you can get a domain that is your name or, or something kind of interesting and catchy, people will remember that. And they'll go back to that and that works as advertising for you, kind of building your own brand as a, as a developer. That's something else too that having a network is really helpful for. Getting to know programmers in your area, having a community online that you can reach out to and say, hey, I, I built this site, I built this portfolio, can you, can you review it? Can you look at it for me? Uh, you'll get a lot of really good feedback. Sometimes feedback is hard and that's okay. That's how you grow. Uh, but that is a good way to, to check the work you're doing again and kind of see what you know, but in a practical way that will help your resume grow and help your job opportunities grow as well. Yeah, thanks, Scott. That's a that's kind of a fun way to, you know, like I said, I'm not a front end programmer, so I'm not really an ideas person either. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not terribly creative. I'm just very good with numbers, and so that is something that I have uh, have found for myself. Is if I go back to one of my early ideas, I don't have to have a new idea. I can just make it better, and that's a little a little bit of a trick, but it also helps you focus on really making things well instead of just making a lot of things. Um, though there's nothing wrong with that either. Right now, I think there are a, a lot of concerns about job prospects and about how the industry is faring. And as somebody who works as a programmer full time, uh, there have definitely been changes in the industry. But the nice thing about technology and about programming and software is that pretty much every company is reliant on it now. And so we may see a shift from more of these little product kind of fun companies to really serious medical companies and companies that help connect people who need it. But those companies all still rely on software. And so there are lots of big problems still to solve. There are lots of big companies that still need support. And uh, this is actually a really good time to get into software and into programming. Um, not to mention the fact that pretty much all companies are remote now. And as a programmer, that's really easy to do. If I worked at a restaurant, I couldn't bring the entire kitchen home with me uh, and cook and then mail the food back. But as a programmer, I can bring my laptop home with me and I can work from home and help take care of my family and be close. And at the same time, produce really good quality work for people all over the country. And so it's a really interesting field to be in right now, um, just because programmers have established patterns around that kind of work. 
that a lot of other industries are just now trying to figure out. Yeah, Scott, you're exactly right. Technology is not going anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, Rodney. So I haven't really touched much on that, but part of part of SC Code's offerings, um, and thanks for asking about this, used to be in-person classes, and that's something that we still want to offer. Uh, the structure of those is kind of flipped classroom and, and is something that we can offer in a way that you can come out to a meetup at a library, for example, uh, somewhere local to you. Meet up with lots of people, talk to mentors who are in your area, get step-by-step -step reviews of your code and, and help working through problems. And that's a really, really great thing to do. Uh, that's not something that we have a timeline on right now, but it is something we want to get back to. And it's something that we've got a pretty good network around the state. And so wherever you're at, there's probably somewhere close that we can can uh, you know set up meetups and set up local connections. Until we're able to get back to those in-person classes, a platform like Slack, online chat, is a really good way to get started. Uh, we do have localized channels, so you can join the upstate channel or the Charleston area channel, get to know people in your area, and once we start doing those in-person meetups again, then you can come out and already know some of the people on the ground, uh, which takes some of that intimidation away, right? Takes some of those first hurdles out of the way. Um, we, do, we do do those in-person uh, reviews, though. The other thing that we do right now, uh, back to that remote concept, is video calls. Um, I've actually, I've, I've been on a couple calls with students who were really having trouble with something and just wanted to ask a question and are better talking in person. And just like we're talking right now and you know, you're on chat and I'm on a video, we could both be on a video, we could both be on chat. There's lots of ways to interact. And so th this is a really, really great time to learn these new things because if you have questions, there's lots of ways to get them answered. Um, but we do, um, we are looking at and we do as a rule offer those, those in-person courses when we can. Yeah, thanks for asking about that. Yeah, and just like Leah said, Slack is a really, really great place to connect. Um, that opens up a, a lot of ways just to get to know people. And even if we can't all go out and hang out together right now, we can hang out online. And once we have a, a little more freedom to go out safely and everybody is safe and healthy, then we can all know each other already when we go out and head to a meetup or head to a, a local group to practice our coding together. If you have any questions that are, are local, um, certainly feel free to ask those. Um, by local, I mean like questions about maybe jobs in your area or people to meet up with. We, we've got a pretty big network. We do have thousands of people that we've, we've worked with as, as a platform. And so we can absolutely help connect you to people who can answer questions about your area, even if I can't personally answer them. You know, I'm in Greenville. I know this area. I'm actually from Newberry, so I know kind of the Greenville-Columbia corridor, but we can connect you with people all over the state if you have uh, bigger questions for your particular zone. Scott, thank you, man. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for being here. We're, we're glad to have you, and certainly uh, hope to see you on the platform and see you on Slack. Sure. So Rodney, I started coding, I think I probably wrote my first line of code when I was seven or eight and I'm 32 now. So 20, 20 something years. I said I was good at math. I should probably be faster at that. <laughs> um, when I started programming, it was to code video games. Like a lot of people, um, I think in general, who get into programming, the first thing you say is, hey, I want to make a video game, right? And so that's why I started and I built a lot of little games on my own. And, and then when I was in high school, realized I could make some money at it. And so I built websites for my school system, the high school and middle school that I went to. I helped build their websites while I was going to them. And, um, and then, like I said, I actually went down the medical track as a career and, and majored in something totally non-technical. Um, went to medical school for a little while, did, did a medical job for a really long time, about 16 years. And that whole time just kept programming on the side. 
full-time professionally, I've been programming for about six years now. Um, this has been my, my 40 hour a week or more day job um, for about six years. Thank you, Scott. Scott, Scott's my math man tonight. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, Rodney, thank you. That's a that's a good question. Um, certainly, it's. I think it has a lot more to do with quality over quantity. I've worked with people who've programmed for two years and are way over my head already, and I've worked with people who've programmed their whole lives and never really wanted to go full time. And so I'm a little bit ahead of them. Um, you can you can get there very quickly depending on what you're focusing on but that consistency and perseverance again to go back to the the, the business motivational talk is really the best thing you can do to, to drive your career and drive your skills forward nobody else has any other questions right now, I think we'll probably go ahead and wrap up for this evening. Um, please do join us next week. We're doing this every Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, I'm not sure what we're covering tonight. <laughs> we're covering next week. I know what we covered tonight, um, but I'm sure it'll be something exciting. So watch out on Twitter and on Slack for announcements about what we'll be covering. And please do join us. Join us in Slack. It's totally free to join. Um, join us on the platform, try out some programming, see what you think. Let us know if you have problems. Let us know if you have suggestions. Let us know if you have successes. We'd love to celebrate those with you too. Um, so thanks for joining us tonight, and we will see you next week. Good night, everybody. <laughs>